Perfecto. Okay, everybody, uh, super, super, like I said a million times, and you can expect me to say it more and more, is I'm happy to have you all here. I want to make sure that I can also see the chat for when um, uh, any questions might ultimately roll through. But what um, I wanted to start off with was essentially, like Yusuf had mentioned, my name is Evan Lee. I am the head of creative strategy here at Motion. Um, and that's just a fancy way of saying I get to work with the best brands, the best agencies, whoever it might be, literally every single day on creative strategy. Now, I know that term is something that we'll define in a little bit, but before we get into all things creative strategy, I just wanted to cover some high level pieces first. So what I wanted to do first is I want to talk a little bit about motion. I want to get into some housekeeping and then ultimately learn some about you. So perfect. When we're talking about motion at a high level, the way that we think about ourselves is ultimately being the hub for creative strategy. So all of the details that we'll get into today and the high level uh, element of how we enable this process is we make it really easy for you to be able to analyze what exactly is going on in your accounts visualize this so everybody, no matter your technical uh, competency, is able to see what's going on, and then share these insights with everyone involved. So these are some of the parameters that I'll be chatting through today. And from a housekeeping perspective, there's three things that come to mind. The first thing is that any questions you might have, please, please, please just throw it into the chat that we have. And something that I like to note is, is I trust a lot of you who are in the chat with us today. So if you see a question that you might be able to an answer, please throw your response in there. Would love to know how you all are thinking about the world and adding value and getting the communi uh, community talking together. Sound good? Sounds good, perfect. The second thing I want to note is that anyone who's attending this session is ultimately gonna be able to access 20% off of Motion for three months. You can use the code MH20, so mark or hire 20 type of deal to be able to get that. And then the third thing that I wanted to note is you would have heard me ask Yusuf at the beginning is that both the recording and the deck will be made available after this call. So you'll be able to get those insights that you need and hopefully there's some value that you can ultimately walk away with. Cool. So now when we're talking creative strategy, it's important to dive into all facets of it. But before we get to those facets, I just wanted to do a quick like roll call almost to understand who's in the building with us. So I have different roles being media buyers, creative team members, editors, copywriters, whatever you uh, might be. But if you can, people who are with us in the chat, can you throw in what roles you're currently holding? Perfect, Carl. Thanks, Chris. Creative strategist in the building too. Yep, yep, yep. I love it. I love it. Perfect. So why I like to ask this question is because right away, what this showcases to us is that the concept of creative strategy is so, so, so widespread in terms of who in the org actually cares about it, right? Because ultimately, on one hand, we have a lot of creative people in the building. We have a lot of marketing managers in the building and C-suite executives. So there's so many teams involved in this process who it's applicable to. So that's why I'm excited. All of you have different perspectives. So you can be able to provide insights that actually matter, no matter the role, right? So I think the first place that I wanted to start here before we get into the true meat and potatoes of it is just starting with some definitions. And I want to start with an easy one. What is creative strategy when I use that term? So when we're talking about creative strategy, the first thing that I like to highlight here is why has it become like relevant? So what I like to highlight is that creative has now become the most important lever for success, especially when it comes to your paid advertising. Now, there's a number of reasons why this is the case in all honesty, right? Like I think the most uh, immediate culprit is going to be iOS 14 and lack of data now being transferred through, like making creative your targeting. But there's also things like the creator economy rising, the age of TikTok for however long that stays, and really enabling the ability to be so visual with the storytelling that you have going on. But the funny thing is, is creative is now the most important part of success for paid advertising. But what we also know is, is that the teams involved, funny enough, are almost just so different in personality types. On one hand, we have our media buying teams or marketing management teams and people who are a lot more analytical, like nose into the data, spreadsheets, figuring it out. Whereas on the other side of things, we have everyone in the chat who's a creative team member in the building. So what that means is exactly that. You're more creative, you're more visual, you're more conceptual. And the things that make both of these two styles of roles great at their jobs almost creates a natural friction between them when they actually need to be married at the hip in order to achieve the revenue goals that are at hand. So when I'm using the terminology of creative strategy, 
What I'm actually referencing is the sides of the brains or the teams that are involved, that natural gap, and creative strategy acts as that bridge. So how can we actually build a process necessary to marry these two teams and to ensure that they're acting in unison? And when it comes to everything creative strategy, you're going to hear me say it a million times, like it is a process. I'm going to give you a better look at this in the future or later in the presentation. But that process can almost be detailed into, set, into a set of repeatable steps that allows you to consistently pump out the best creative possible and everyone moving forward together. Cool. Amazing, everybody. So we are now aligned on, on what we call creative strategy here, right? But I think a big thing that happens, it just becomes a conversation of who actually manages this process. So from the granular level, all the way up to CMO and C-suite, anyone who's on this call, essentially, you'll want people in the right places so you're producing the best creative possible. And where I actually like to start is creative strategy is one of those like newer roles more than anything. I'm happy to see a lot of people in the chat but I almost like to consider it a hat. And the really cool thing about making it a hat is that allows people, no matter the career path or background, to be able to jump into that role and truly own that. Now, what do I mean by that? So in these headshots here, you can see I have myself with different hair, but we have Lauren, we have Audrey, and we have Nicole. Now they all hold creative strategist titles and like crushing it essentially. But the cool thing here is that they come from so well, a vast type of differences in terms of backgrounds. Whereas Lauren comes from a design background. She has created the assets. She's shot assets. She's been a creative director, editor, all of that good stuff. Audrey leans heavier into digital marketing. So copywriting, general digital marketing, all of that good stuff. Myself and Nicole, media buying backgrounds. So living in those ad accounts, running those ads across all platforms and all that kind of stuff. And why this is so crucial to acknowledge is because even though your team might not be staffed with a creative strategist or anything along those lines, I like to think of it as once I showcase the different steps in this process, somebody can put their hand up. It creates an opportunity for them to not only grow their career and see what's possible, but also provide a set guideline of steps needed to produce those creatives. So that's what I think about when I talk about that creative strategist hat. And with those people who manage the process, it's now important to talk about why is it an actual role? Why is it a hat that somebody should wear? And this is where it gets um, a little bit trickier. So part of the reason I had asked everybody what your roles were is because in this process of building the right creative, there are so many teams involved, right? On one hand, let's talk about it. We have our media buyers who are, again, very analytical, but might lack on the creative side. We have our creative team members who can sometimes turn into order takers and lose that motivation for what's going on. We have our brand teams that need to make sure that the assets look a specific way. We have any agencies that we might be using. And then we have management who's going to care about that bottom line, making sure we're trucking in the right direction. So with all of these teams involved, we almost need a way to make sure we act in unison. And on top of the teams that we see here, I think another common piece to acknowledge is that we could have all of the creative findings in the world. So, so many data points that are necessary to us, but they're meaningless if we're not able to do something with them. So whoever is wearing that hat of creative strategy, what that allows us to do, it allows us to formulate this all together. So that means every single team that I showcased that will be involved in this process is easily able to point to the process to say, okay, where are we? What are we doing? Thumbs up, thumbs down. We're then able to take all of that data that we have and organize it. So we're testing in an appropriate manner. And this is going to make sure that whoever's wearing that creative strategist hat is ultimately at the forefront of this process. Cool. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about process a million times over in terms of what we're actually have going on here. And when I talk about the process, um, I showcased this earlier, right? Like these set of steps that you can follow being research, ideation, briefing, creation, eval, launch, and analysis. But the big thing here, it becomes like this process, how do we start to organize it? And what do we call that? So our team can begin to execute upon it. So that's where here at Motion, just in general, I know a lot of people do this. It's we call them creative sprints. So these sprints are the process required to be able to then say like the steps you follow and you can cadence it out accordingly. So when we're talking about creative sprints, um, I, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to get to the details and nitty gritty of this entire flow in a bit.
But what I first wanted to do was continue to level set in terms of what a creative sprint actually includes. So when we're talking about creative sprints and keeping the strategist in that driver's seat, essentially what we're saying here is that there's three levels to this equation. The first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure everybody involved is aligned on the decision that we make. What ad creative are we making next? What are we testing? All of the different questions you want answers to. The second thing to note here is that getting buy-in with the sprint process is so much easier because all of a sudden, the decisions that you're looking to make can be backed by data. So it's available to you. You can have really strong briefs to communicate what's required. So you'll be able to get the buy-in that you need. And then the other piece here is when we're talking educating and upskilling, I think we can all appreciate on this call um, the importance of a manager and their role in your lives. And really, when we're talking of managers, why don't we create a culture of upskilling, improvement, and just collaboration across the entire board? So what that means is we're giving every team a chance to shine. So in some cases, I've already talked about this a bunch, but media buyers might lack on the creative end. So our creative team members can give a peek into their brains in, in a meeting or on Loom or on Slack, whatever it might be. Whereas our creative team members might be a little bit weaker on the data. So the media buyers can jump in and start to educate on what the most important metrics to them would be. And by following this three-step process here, essentially what we want to be able to achieve is increased efficiency, better creative output, which is then going to make more dollars for you at the end of the day. So it sets you up for success along those lines. Uh, and then before I move any farther, you're going to notice that I'm someone who prefers to talk in buckets. And like I said, this, is good, this presentation is going to be made available after the call. But just as a quick summary to make sure we're aligned on creative strategy and the creative sprint process, the first thing to acknowledge here is that we have a natural disconnect that's created between performance brains and then creative brains. We want to help bridge that gap with creative strategy. We know that anyone can jump in who wants to raise their hand as long as they know the set steps to follow. And with so many different inputs from teams to data, we want to make sure that it's easy to action upon and creative sprints are the process that we can follow. Okay, so that's a bunch of theory so far, everybody. I now actually wanted to jump into a quick poll. So Yusuf's going to enable a poll for everybody. With the definitions and what I'd showcased here today, can everybody take a second to, to answer the question of, is creative strategy actively applied within your organization today? We'll give it a, a minute or so. Right. I love it. Throw it into the poll for me, please. I appreciate you. <laughs> Perfect. And Charlotte has a good point of being able to communicate what's going on. Bottom line is very important, but giving or making sure that you can expose the process of how you're going to get to an improved bottom line is equally as important. Cool. And while we're collecting poll answers, Something that I'm excited about is no matter what your answer is that we can see here, I'm excited for the rest of the, the presentation I'm going to walk through, give you some insight into every single one of these. So if you're not sure if creative strategies applied at your org, this is going to be a great introduction to what's going on. If it's not applied at your organization, I'll have some tactical steps um, being able to say like, okay, where should I start? And if you are applying creative strategy, what we're going to do is just going to take it and supercharge it. So it's, hey, you're started with the basics. Let's create even some more um, guidelines around how we can produce it. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Yusuf, if we can go ahead and wrap up that poll, and then we can take a look at those responses in a bit. Does that sound good? Perfecto. Cool. So now is when we start to talk a little bit more about the actual process that we have going on here. So I've talked about this, uh, I'll call it a flywheel of steps that you can follow. And what I first wanna figure out before I even like talk about what's, what you do within the flywheel is I wanna think about the actual cadence to set up. So how often should I be meeting with my team? If I'm a team member, how often should I be having these conversations? And the first categories that I include in a creative sprint are two separate categories. So the first thing that I like to highlight is bucket number one being new concepts and variations. And then the second bucket are our iteration buckets. Now, why these are important to classify and place into their necessary buckets is let's put some definitions behind these words. When I'm using the terminology of net new concept, 
What I'm really referring to here is when we talk about output, it's usually a larger quantity of creative assets that required heavy execution, heavy briefing, and a lot of work for the team. And typically these new concepts are associated with marketing calendars, product launches, promos, the typical stuff that you're all familiar with. So that's a checkbox right on that end. When we're talking about variations, why these are helpful is because before you even collect any data, you can actually maximize your effort to reward. So what that means in my example of variation is let's imagine that the problem that we're looking to solve is that there's an acne problem. The concept that we're leaning into is before and after, and the video itself is around 15 seconds long. Now that could easily just be one video, put all your time in there and launch it live and you're happy. But a way that you can really extend the reach, especially related to paid advertising, is we can actually get three separate ads out of this. So what that means is ad one and all of the ads that we showcase here, they actually all have the same body content and they all have the same CTA. The only difference is that we're using the hook that consists here. Uh, so when we're talking about hooks, what I'm really referring to is like, can we hook someone to stop their scroll in their feeds? And what we're testing is that ad one, ad two, and ad three have separate hooks. So we're seeing is that initial three seconds enticing enough to actually get someone to stop. So that's when we're able to layer on a net new concept with multiple variations. And then with that final definition, it's related to iterations. And the main difference between an iteration and a variation is that iteration is always going to be related to data. So instead of just creating a bunch of different options to choose from, what an iteration is going to allow you to do is once a creative has been live in the world, you can actually go ahead and look at the data to determine what has happened so we can actually plan what to make next based on that data. So we might see that before and after doesn't actually work. And if that before and after doesn't work, maybe we'll lean into five-star review or something along those lines. So these three buckets or two to three buckets allows you to plan out what that cadence could look like. And ultimately where you're going to land is a process similar to this. So what we're looking at here is a set plan that everyone in your org can come back to when you're talking about the type of creative that's going to be produced. So what that means is in this, uh, in this sprint cadence that we're looking at, it's we know iterations are easier to conduct. In all honesty, we might just apply a text overlay or something like that. So with an iteration, we can actually go ahead and say every 14 days, let's bang one out. Whereas a net new concept, it takes more time. Like there's a huge promo event coming up. There's a marketing com uh, event coming up, all that kind of stuff. So what we might do is we might plot that net new concept on a 30 day timeline instead. And what we're going to be able to do is that your creative team members are actually going to have a predictable amount of workflow coming their way that they can then produce. Everyone else involved in the process knows when they can add their contributing ideas, and you're able to maintain a cadence very similar to this. Sound good, everybody? Sounds good. Okay. Now, the next question that I look to answer with this process is like, it looks really pretty, right? To be able to say, yep, let's cadence it out. This is where it makes sense. But what I like to add here is that this cadence is going to be different for your brand, depending on like the stage of your company, the spend that you're offering and the teams that you have. So what I mean by that is to determine the spaces between the different sprints that we're running. We're answering two major questions. So we're answering the testing question and we're answering the creation question. So when I'm talking about testing, this is really referring to like your media buyers are able to advise on this process. And really what this is saying is it's saying, how much money do I have to spend on a specific ad in order to deem it statistically relevant? Meaning how much money do I have to spend to feel good, to feel good about a decision that I'm going to make? Now this testing bucket here is going to vary, right? Like it's going to be, if you're spending $10,000 a month, it's going to be longer than if you're spending a million dollars a month when you'll be able to, to do all of this a lot faster. So that's the first bucket to figure out. And then the second bucket to figure out, which is um, sometimes forgotten in the grand scheme of things. So my creative folks, like shout out to you all. It's almost a handshake agreement to say, how long is it going to take to produce a specific asset? So what that means is when you're coming to those handshake agreements, when we're talking about iterations, so those smaller changes rooted in data, we can almost look at each other as a team and say like, hey team, can we commit to a three-day turnaround for a text overlay or like a voice swap 
something along those lines. Yes, perfect, let's do it. Whereas a new concept, we know it takes longer. It's like, hey team, based on our resourcing, based on our spend, like can we take 20 days to be able to turn this around? And once you get uh, basically a handshake sign off on what this SLA will look like in combination with how long you need to, or how much you need to spend in testing, that actually formulates the specific cadence that you can work with to produce this. So that means, let's say, um, testing wise, I need to be live in the account for 10 days to collect data, and it takes me four days to produce an asset. I can follow a 14 day cadence, and it starts to match this iteration bucket that we can see here. And everybody's content or just even like approach is going to be a little bit different depending on those two levers, like I was mentioning. Cool. So once you have, this is, this is really the meat and potatoes here, but once you have that cadence built out to say, how often are we coming together as a team to be able to launch this stuff live and agree on the different elements of our sprints and now comes to the individual steps within every single one of these buckets. So whether it's iteration or net new concepts, I'm going to follow these set steps here to determine what to do next. So when we're talking about these steps, the really good thing here is that whoever is wearing that hat of creative strategist is able to own this, but it's cool because you can pull in different team members depending on where their expertise lies at the end of the day. So what that means is, of course, I'm gonna go into a lot more detail is in this first bucket here, we have our research bucket. And research is all about looking at your own data, competitor information, and you're really looking to build personas. When we're talking about ideation, this is our plan of attack. So a creative backlog of things or angles we wanna test and anything along those lines. Our briefing is making sure that it's a translated piece that like management can understand, creative team can understand, and everyone in between. And then of course we need to create the assets. Now could the creation part, is one of those specific examples I like to highlight because it doesn't necessarily have to be the person who's wearing that hat of creative strategist doing the content creation. This could be someone else who's just really good at InDesign, frame and making videos, editing, shooting, all of that kind of stuff. And then once we actually have the asset, we wanna make sure that it's aligned and we can pull the brand team in, we can align on goals, that kind of stuff. And finally, we can hand it back to the media buyer who launches that thing live. So collecting the data that's ultimately required and ending this cycle or this creative flywheel with the creative analysis step. So we've done all of this amazing work up until this point. How are we going to make sure that we're uh, memorializing a finding and understanding what's truly happened in this process? And the really good thing about a flywheel is that if something breaks, you know where it breaks. The same way we think about a funnel, right? So I think Charlotte was mentioning earlier, like being able to understand the marketing people and wanting to be on a call for that. It's like, once you understand the tasks in each of these steps, it's being able to say like, well, what could we do? And where are people's strengths to be able to enable them to follow said steps? Cool. I always talk about how this um, keeps the creative strategist in the driver's seat. But now what I wanted to do is actually talk about like the examples. So that flywheel of research all the way to the end of creative analysis, let's talk about examples at that point. And Dominic, it aligns with your question. We'll get to that point of how do we start to memorialize and you'll have some options, of course. Cool. So the first bucket that we're ultimately going to care about is our research bucket that we can see here. And when we're talking about research, really what I'm referring to is like, how do we build out the optimal personas, avatars, characters, whatever we like to call them. And to build out these characters, essentially, there's just a set of questions that you can answer from a most basic standpoint to be able to find out. And the first set of questions that I like to, to introduce to be able to start to build the personas are what you know to be true about your brand already. So this is where anybody in, is able to dive in. And honestly, you all have good gut feels. So this is a good place for that to come out. And you can start to talk about what are the major value props or USPs that we're offering? What are our past purchasers' characteristics? And is that the ideal consumer we wanted to go after? What are our paid media channels saying? And who's actually buying from us? So getting the information you know to be true about your brand is super important. But the second thing that we want to start diving into is not only what we know to be true about your own brand and what you believe to be true about your brand, is we want to start to understand what people are saying about us in the wild. So there's so many different places you could go, whether it be Google, YouTube, Reddit, and that kind of stuff. But some of the examples that I like to highlight 
is you can just jump right into your social media comments even to start to understand what's going on there. For example, my Canadians in the house will know, but we see, Frederick, we see Fredericton, New Brunswick being um, located here. So we can almost create a persona just based out of Canada and seeing what's going on there. Whereas one of them talks about a sweetness level, whereas sweetness level, that gives us a unique selling prop or a problem to be able to tackle. So get that information directly from our customers' mouths or their fingertips, essentially. The other place that we can look is basically into our reviews. So whether these reviews are Google reviews, site reviews, Amazon reviews, YouTube reviews, all of that kind of stuff, you'll be able to learn either what people really love about your products. So that means you can lean further into that, or you can find out what people hate, which is honestly equally as powerful. So it's like, how do we address that in some of the creatives that we're ultimately producing? And then the final piece that I like to highlight here is you're actually able, because social media is so visual, to dive into things like your tagged posts. So what your tagged posts are going to give you, tagged posts are going to give you the actual look and feel of how people represent and speak to your brand, not just the brand identity you truly believe in your soul, but how people are taking it into the wild and being featured with it. So that's how that starts to grow in terms of our personas. Awesome. Uh, a couple people that I like to highlight, uh, if you are on Twitter, if you're following whoever it might be, I like Sarah Levenger. She always talks about when you build your characters or personas, like um, personas over scripts, we are the directors, not the screenwriters. So what this really enables is that creative person on the other end to truly be creative, embody the persona that we've noticed and take that to the next level. And another good friend of mine, Patrick. So Patrick always talks to me about reviewing tag posts. It's like, these are how people are actually talking about you as much as you know what your brand says, dig into that area there. So that's how we come to a place of really being able to build out what those personas look like. Now, after we have an idea of who we wanna go after in the world, it's important to figure out the necessary look and feel to match that audience. So with ideation, there's many different levels to it, in all honesty, and I'll talk about three of them. So the first thing is just talking about different ways you can share look and feel amongst your teams. So you can be as easy as like, hey, I have a shared group chat with my marketing team where we kind of just send ads or like TikToks or anything we see back and forth to each other. So it's just like, what's actually going on? What do we like the look and feel of? What's going to resonate? Telling that story out. The other thing you can do, which is a little bit more formal are like literally having spreadsheets. So it's just have a spreadsheet that's banged out and being able to say, these are our competitors. These are the different ads linked to Facebook ads library or TikTok top ads and getting what you need. But the third thing that you can do is you can use other platforms. So there's ones like Addison or Foreplay that can go ahead and be able to save different ads that you're seeing in the wild and create a board, ultimately a look and feel that you're looking at. Perfect, Chris. That's awesome. It's funny when you say it that way, but completely understand where you're coming from. <laughs> and then the last thing that I'll note, um, I guess a couple more is like, it's great to look elsewhere. So the competitors and sharing information amongst your team, but please, please, please do not neglect your own data. So you'll, be want, uh, you'll want to be able to dive into certain time frames, certain events throughout the year, but being able to say like, hey, what actually worked in Black Friday, Cyber Monday, 2022, so we do something better in 2023 is honestly equally as important. Because once you're able to use that competitor information, as well as your own um, basically data, you can come up with the appropriate look and feel, and you can create a backlog of different tests that you'd like to run. So it could easily be like I was showcasing earlier, the problem we want to solve is acne and the concepts that we can lean into to be able to solve that or angles are like before and after shots, um, non-comedogenic and the list can or non-oily, I'm kind of spitballing here, but go off the top of your head to basically formulate those angles and your can creative team can truly be creative and start to de develop creative to match the problem, the different concepts or angles, and then produce the end asset at the end of the line. So that takes us to that point. Cool. Um, now's the point on the call when I wanted to really appeal to our marketers in the house. So what I wanted to start to do was actually dive a lot deeper into ways that we can analyze this data because it's great to look at your own data, but you need to know how to be able to look at your data to be able to make different assumptions of what we have going on. I'm going to be able to talk about basically uh, like video analysis today. If you have like static questions though, throw them into the chat. So I'll be sure to get to those as well, but I'm focusing primarily on video just for simplicity on this call. Okay. So basically when we're talking about granular analysis here, what I like to first highlight are the different data points that are most relevant to you as a creative person. 
So everyone on this call is familiar with bottom line and we know we need to get return on ad spend. We know we need to get a strong conversion rate and everything on those lines. But what we also need to know are what are the contributing factors that allow us to get a strong return on ad spend and allow us to achieve a, a, a conversion rate that we're happy with. And that's where these metrics come into play. So whenever I'm talking to creative team members or people running these creative sprints, I really like to hone in on the importance of your top and middle of funnel of metrics and how they apply to the bottom of funnel metrics. So I have a bunch of good ones here in terms of like our click-through rates, our video play rates, all of that good stuff that I'll talk about in more detail. But if there's one that I like to highlight, and this probably is common knowledge to all, but to set it out there, if there's one that I like to highlight, it's our hook rates. Because when we're talking about hook rates, what we're saying is like, hey, can someone stop their scroll in their feeds and then click to our website? And I'll get into more detail, like I said, right now. So talking to videos here, um, to go through some examples together, when I'm speaking to videos, there are four different ways I like to break down a video to understand what type of changes we can ultimately make. The very first thing that I'm looking at is my thumbnail performance. The next thing that I'm looking at is my hook performance. The third thing that I'm looking at is my post hook performance. And that means my storytelling beyond the first three seconds. And then the final thing that I'm looking at is do I have a creative problem or is it a landing page problem that I'm running into? So, so many different ways that we can ultimately get to this data. So let's break this down together. And if you have any questions, like I was saying, throw it into the chat. So let's start with our thumbnail performance. And before I get into actually analyzing this data, let's talk about the thumbnail retention metric. And let's also talk about why thumbnails are important. So when we're talking about why thumbnails are important, especially with platforms like Meta, so Facebook and Instagram, why it becomes so important is because the way Meta's algorithm works is that it ingests the information that comes from the thumbnail. Even if something's on autoplay, the first place that you're feeding Meta's algorithm is you're giving them a thumbnail to say, hey, read the information, scan what's going on, and then determine who to go after in the market. So that's the very first thing that you're looking to do. And then to measure this metric here, and if that's Roy, uh, shout out to Roy, he knows all about this one. But if we're measuring this, the metric that we can use is our thumbnail retention. And it's essentially saying like, hey, out of anybody who has seen a specific video, what percentage have actually continued their scroll to start the video is what we're looking at. So in this thumbnail performance, to walk through a couple granular examples and really get deep on the marketing numbers here, is there's two situations that I like to highlight. There's the obvious of what's working, and then there's the area of room for improvement. So when we're talking about a what's working standpoint, what I like to look for in all scenarios is a maximization of the metrics that we're showcasing here. So in my case, I have that thumbnail retention, and then I have that thumb stop ratio, so who's stopping their scrolls. And what I can see is right at the top here, we get a lot of people in comparison to the others having a higher thumbnail retention, but we also have quite a strong thumb stop ratio. So this speaks to me as something that's doing quite well. So we should say, let's do more of that. It's a very simple next step. It's like, it has a text overlay. Let's try more of that. Creative team, pump it out, good to go. The other side of the equation is when there's room for improvement. So no longer it's just doing well, let's do more of it and figure it out that way. But basically, when we're talking about room for improvement, I'm actually looking for an inverse relationship. So what that means is I'm looking for an instance where my thumbnail retention isn't as strong as I'd like it to be. So that means people aren't actually continuing their scroll and starting a video. But I notice that my thumb stop ratio is actually the third highest in the account. Because when I see this, what it's ultimately telling me is that it's telling me that, hey, I don't have too many people continuing their scrolls to start a video, but those who do are actually watching the first three seconds. That's the right person. I want them to be there. So when I'm thinking about what I can do next, I can easily say, okay, team, let's try and turn this 83% number into like 87. And what that means is the creative team, all you'll need to do is basically produce a different thumbnail instead of just a text overlay TikTok style, maybe throw some emojis in there. Maybe you just throw in like a different part of the video that you're ultimately focused on, but you can really, really captivate an audience and basically take advantage of the algorithm that way. Cool. So that's the first part that I like to talk about when we're saying specific examples of what you can do. The next stage of this is now diving into our hooks. 
Now, if I haven't lost you already, I want to pull you back right in here because again, the hooks is like basically the, the Michael Jordan of being able to talk about metrics when it comes to, to paid social and paid social creatives. So in this, in this report here, just to reiterate what metrics we're looking at. So when I'm talking about thumb stop ratio, the clear definition that I love to give is that, hey, you need someone to stop their scroll in their feed before they click anywhere to go and buy. So how are you going to make sure that that first three seconds is enticing as possible to get someone to stop their scrolls? So that's truly what our thumb stop ratio metric is measuring. And when we compare this to our click-through rates, we get a lot better insights. So again, I'm going to go through a couple different examples here, but in this report, what we can now look at is what's working from a thumb stop perspective. And you'll hear me say the words again, but we're looking for a maximization. So where am I seeing a nice and high thumb stop ratio in comparison to the rest of the report? So when I'm seeing a high thumb stop ratio, what that lets me know is that people are stopping their scrolls. I'm doing my job as a creative person. I feel really, really great about it. So with that in mind, the conversation becomes what's really good about that first three seconds so we can easily do more of it as we move forward. So that's where we're really able to take off with it. The other side, which I always talk about being a little bit more impactful, in all honesty, is the room for improvement sections. So it's great to look at what's doing well and say, amazing, let's do more of it. But what I like to do is say, where's the low hanging fruit? If we can make a small creative change, is this going to be able to give us those results? Better time, uh, well, better like efficiency, better time on your creative team side, better output in terms of dollars. And when I look at this bar right here, what we can ultimately see, and as I'll walk you through this, what we can ultimately see is that here we have a much lower thumb stop ratio in comparison to the rest of the account, but a nice and high click through rate in comparison to the rest of the account. So, what that means is that here we know that not too many people are actually stopping their scrolls, but those who are are actually clicking and going to your website. So that means creative team, let's set this goal together. What we want to try and do is we want to try and increase this thumb stop ratio so more people are stopping their scrolls at the end of the day. So that means the change that we can make is by trying two new variations. Remember that terminology that we use, or iterations, on being able to say, okay, let's do one new version, different three seconds with before and after, another different three seconds with five star, another three, star, uh, another three second iteration with like a UGC variation or UGC mashup, something along those lines to really be able to plug ahead. Cool. So this is really where we're getting into like all the different, um, like I want to say the guts of it, which is kind of gross, but like the nuts and bolts of breaking down the videos. And just to take it to a couple more steps before I get to the rest of the presentation as I'll jump here. So in this report, we've talked about our thumbnails. We've talked about our first three seconds and getting someone to be hooked. But what we also need to talk about is the post three second experience. Are we telling a story that's enticing and gets people to do the action that we want them to do? And in this report, what I'm comparing here to talk about metrics once again, so again, familiar to creative team members, is that we're able to compare our click-through rates, meaning people who are clicking on the creative we made and going where we want them. I'm able to compare them to our 100% video play rate. And what this metric is telling me is it's basically telling me out of anybody who has seen the video asset I'd made, what percentage of that initial 100% who started my video actually made it to the end? That's really what we're looking at in this case. And what I wanted to focus on in this example is specifically where is there room for improvement? And what we can look at here is you'll notice that it's very similar in terms of that visual representation of the thumb stop report. So what we're looking at here is on the far right, our click-through rate is quite low on this specific creative in comparison to others. But what we're also noticing is that the 100% video play rate, stronger than ever, something I'm super happy with, right? But the interesting part here becomes like, hey, I have enticing content. People are watching my entire video. Why are they not clicking where I want them to go? So when you're working with your creative team, once again, or thinking about what you can do based off of this data, I might actually scan the video. And what I scan the video for is I'm going to look closer to the end of the video when people are watching. Do I have a call to action there? Does it say shop now? Check out the new collection. Learn more. Something along those lines. Because I might just be missing a CTA for people to take the action that I want them to take. So when I work with the creative team, the simple ask is for this specific video, 
Let's add a CTA at the end of this bad boy. Let's make it happen. Come to life, get it into the account and ultimately test moving forward. Cool. Um, the last step in this process is creative versus landing page. I'm going to talk about it closer to the end of this presentation, in all honesty, because I have another section where it can be applicable because I wanted to push through and start chatting about briefing of what we have here. Because just as a quick recap, folks, where we've gotten to up until this point is we've been able to conduct the research that's necessary to build out the personas. So who are we going after? We've been able to ideate in terms of what's the look and feel of the creative backlog. And we've been able to understand some of the data that's available to us to make the decisions of what to test. But this is probably, if not, the most important step because briefing is gonna take all of this information you have and be able to translate it to everyone else across the org. So this is where you're gonna be able to translate it to a creative team member and upskill to be able to say what's going on there. This is where we're gonna be able to um, uh, basically show management when we're talking about ideas and data points we're looking at of how we're thinking about creative performance to get buy-in. And when I'm talking about briefing, I know uh, people on this call probably have a much more like detailed brief. I show it for specific examples. But the big thing about me as it relates to briefing is that I like to start with a hypothesis, like we can see down here. So when we're talking about hypotheses, um, I always like to say is whenever you're testing something, have a goal in mind, have a guess in mind of something that you want to achieve. So I'm always going to mention in this specific case, my persona is young people, the value prop is sustainability in the city. And what I'm guessing is that building assets around this new persona that I've built is going to generate more dollars. And I actually want to have a goal of a CAC of $50 to be able to hit that and be good to go. And at that point, we're able to really align with the rest of our team and say like, okay, so we've all aligned. New concept we're testing is this persona, this value prop. The way we're going to measure it is the hypothesis we see here. Let's go. I know what I got to do to ultimately make this happen. So that's on the new concept front. When we're talking briefing on the iterative front, so those iterations rooted in data, it's literally the exact same steps. So you'll notice here again that I'm starting with a hypothesis, except now the hypothesis is very data-driven. So similar to that example I'd mentioned earlier, this specific brief is focused on the first three seconds and improving performance there. So what we have here is my hypothesis, and I've looked across the room and said, everybody good with it? This is what we're testing this week is we're saying that we want to increase that thumb stop ratio. So again, more people stopping their scrolls, but I want to maintain a similar conversion rate or a similar click-through rate because the overall message is working really, really well. And that means, team, here are my asks. I have two separate versions sent in with love. I want to update three seconds in thumbnail and thumbnail. And then my second version, Lavender Hallway, where we just want to do a three-second update, and then we're good to go. Cool. So that briefing and really leaning into a hypothesis will allow this process to become measurable at that point. So after these data points are understood, you're diving into content creation and launch. Honestly, we could dedicate an entire hour just to content creation and launch. So how are you launching these on the platforms, the best way to structure your campaigns, everything in between? And also like, how are you creating these assets? How are you shooting them? What are the angles that you're diving into? So we spend a whole hour. I host a lot of events dedicated to this stuff, like on the motion side of things. So feel free to check us out. Um, but just know this is a process that needs to happen. And after we've gone live to market, the big part that starts to happen is we need to analyze what's gone, on, uh, gone down. So like I mentioned earlier on this call, it would be a shame to do all of that great work, have everyone on the same page, have a data-driven hypothesis, go to market with it, and not actually learn what happened. So at this point, I believe there was a question earlier when we were diving into, hey, where should this stuff live? Where are we storing insights? I like to think of this as a memorialization of findings. And the first step to be able to memorialize it is actually being able to say, we created a hypothesis when we initially launched that, launched the assets. Was it true? Was it false of what we wanted to achieve? So to walk you through this at a high level of what we're seeing here, let me just like outline what we're looking at before we validate. So what we're looking at here is in the far right, this reddish brown column that we can see, this is what we call our control group. And it's the version of the creative that's literally been live the entire time. And it's the version of the creative we've decided to make changes off of. So that's the first thing. The second version that we have here is our V2. So that's that thumbnail and three second change doing its thing. This version in the green is our V3. And that's the thumbnail change right beside that. 
And if we look at our hypothesis, what we wanted to do is we wanted to increase thumb stop ratio and maintain conversion rate. So that means from my control group, what I wanted to see is that this thumb stop ratio number is higher and this conversion rate number is in the same world. So when it gets to validating this information that we're looking at, you'll notice here that in this V2, what's happened? It's true. Awesome. That three second and thumbnail change it increased our thumb stop ratio and it increased our conversion rate. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Whereas our version three, what's happened here is that we've gotten more people to stop their scrolls, but less people to buy. So something about that experience has been a little bit clickbaity in terms of the content that we're putting out there. So this allows everybody uh, just to talk about like the meeting setting or just like Loom or Slack. This allows everybody to come together and truly understand, well, what did we do? What did we learn? And why did this happen? Because you might be in an instance where this version two, like I'm looking at here, is true. We did what we wanted to do. We increased thumb stop and conversion rate. So what we know to be true here is if that three second and thumbnail change worked, let's do it again. Let's just float it into the next sprint that we have scheduled. Let's float it into the next sprint that we have scheduled. But anybody who's a media buyer in the room ultimately knows that this is like best case scenario, right? It's like, hey, I tested three things. One of them is true, one of them is not type of deal. More likely than not, what you're going to run into is an instance where like this is false, false, right? And the really cool thing about having a creative sprint process in play is that it's not the end of the world and you don't have to panic. You not If this is false, false, you're not going to continuously lean into those thumbnail and three second changes. You might just try something brand new. So it's like, let's focus on the creative versus landing page experience. Let's focus on the post three second experience. It gives everyone a North star in terms of the energy they need to focus on. Now, to answer the question that we got earlier about where do these findings live? So motion is a great place for it, just to plug on our end. But another place is like when I highlight some of our community, Rahul and this is Connor, not Rahul, doubled up. But, but these two guys have some really good templates out there that you'll be able to access and click into where you're able to say, well, these are the tests we ran. This is where it can live. Spreadsheets is great. But again, motion can help out there too. Cool. Okay. Um, up until this point, uh, I've talked about the amounts of work that's been created, right? But the last piece that I like to highlight is when we're doing analysis, it's great to think of iteration as basically using the data and making creative changes. But what I also like to showcase here is for any marketing managers in the room, for any CMOs in the room, or just business owners in the room, you can use these creative analysis points to actually dive into so many deeper elements. So what that means is where I can actually start is with influencers. So instead of looking at granular creative and granular creative changes, what we can look at is in my case with influencers, I can understand which influencers are actually making us money on paid social. So that might mean down here, Bumblebee is not doing so well for us on paid. Is Bumblebee doing well for us anywhere else? No, maybe we should move away. Whereas Wheeljack, absolutely crushing it. Shout out to the Transformers. Wheeljack, I'm happy for you. Let's do more of that and allocate our dollars appropriately on that ambassador program side. Now, this style of like analysis isn't limited to influencers. You can actually have this set up per SKU. You can have it set up per product. You can have it set up per landing page, all of that kind of stuff. So you can help determine what type of fulfillment you need because of just inventory and um, like the sales associated with it. But this gives you that high level view to determine what to do next, not only creatively, but in other areas of your business. And then the final thing that I wanted to highlight is, um, and, and even though I, I mentioned it earlier, is being able to make decisions beyond just even like inventory, creative and all of that. What we can start to find out is if we have things like creative problems or landing page problems. So this is going to give teams the ultimate focus on where they need to center their energy and what needs to be completed. So what I mean by that is in this specific report that we're looking at creative versus landing pages, you'll notice here that the metrics that I'm now using are as I'm starting with those click-through rates of who's going to my website and I'm comparing it to the conversion rate. So of those people who went to my website, who actually bought. So this report now allows me to say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're focusing so much time and effort on our creative. Creative team's doing a great job. Look at this, high click-through rate, absolutely crushing it. But what we're noticing is that conversion rate is much lower than the rest of the account. So once the great traffic goes to our website, we notice that there's a friction point that comes to life. So this is where everybody on your teams can collaborate once again to be able to say, all right, creative is good. What's going on on the landing page? 
Creatively, we have this influencer with these value props, but the landing page doesn't have any of that. Should we make it more cohesive? Should we implement a quiz? How do we want that process to change? So these are some of the examples to you when we're talking influences, products, SKUs, or if we're talking creative versus landing page that you have available to you, especially when you're talking about the creative analysis side of things. Cool. Um, so said a lot of words in a short amount of time. Everyone can pick up on how quickly I speak. Uh, I'll open it up for questions really quickly, but from a summary perspective, you're gonna be able to see these dedicated steps like I had spoken about. But like I always say, all of this might be just a little too much overnight. So anyone who's getting started out or not sure, like you had answered in the poll, the very first place that I like to recommend to start is literally if you're making a new creative, like just build a hypothesis out, what are you looking to test? And then once you've built out your hypothesis, try your best to come back to say, was I right or wrong in what I thought? So those are the two steps that make it nice and basic. You don't even need to chunk it out in every 14 days. Just remember to check back. It's a really good place to start. These are people who are online on Twitter. We have a pretty big Twitter following. So follow us if you want, see how people are talking about us. We like to help with every stage of this. So like Miguel dropped into the chat, if there's anything you're interested in, that's what we have going on. And of course, just as a quick reminder, if this was interesting to anybody um, and you don't want to book some time with us, you can always explore Emotion. We have that 20% off using MH20, like I had mentioned. Connect with me on social, connect with me via email, uh, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. But um, on my end, it's been an absolute pleasure, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for, for letting, me, letting me speak to you all. I hope this was valuable. And I'm hoping we can use the last three minutes here um, for Q&A if that's cool. Shout out Ev to Ev. I see you, Evan. Thank you. Uh, Yusuf, did you see any questions come through that you might be able to throw to me really quickly? Sorry, I was trying to keep the chat in both. Yes, no worries. Um, let, me, let me dive straight in. Um, also, do you want to reveal the results of the poll first? or, or Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's hit them with poll results. Are they visible? Oh. I got to share again. Sorry, everybody. So this is what we're looking at. 48% of you all are yes. That makes me so happy. That makes me so happy. I hope this was helpful in terms of like taking it to the next level. For anyone who falls into the no and not sure, again, I hope it's a good just like jump off point of being able to say, okay, let me put my hard hat on. I'll raise my hand to say this is something I want to do and try some stuff out. So thanks for, thanks for participating with Paul, everybody. Well, I'll stop sharing the poll now and dive into the questions. So we have two questions, uh, one from Preston. So where, where can I watch more videos or sign up for more live sessions? Love it. Um, Preston, more than welcome to have you at anything. We have a bunch of stuff on our YouTube channel. Miguel, if you can link that one. Also, if uh, I post things on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter. And you can also like subscribe to our newsletter. We send a ton of stuff out just over our, um, like our CRM communications. Cool. Um, and for the second question from Harish, does Motion provide benchmark reports for the category, current trends at the platform level, or examples of creatives performing well so we can learn and improve our creatives? Really great question. The answer is not yet. We benchmark against like your own data. So you understand like what's realistic in your own account to see what's going on there, but not quite yet on the external side. We have a few more questions actually that, that pop through. Nice. So yeah, another one from Harish. As a small business that does not have an in-house person to help with creative strategy, what are common ways to get help? And then to continue on to that question, what is the structure of small businesses set up between paid media, creative strategy, and creative execution? Great question. The definition of like small business is a little bit skewed in my mind in terms of like the people who I've had the pleasure of interacting with. But I can say at a high level, um, let's say you're an internal team that doesn't have a designer, doesn't have a media buyer, or doesn't have like cre uh, creative strategist resourcing. I'd say like agencies are always good offering. So you get access to like five people for not the cost of adding five or six people to headcount. You can also work with like freelancers. And like I said, you might try to find a freelancer who's uh, like media buyer and does that well, but can also wear the hat of creative strategy. So you have options, but most of it's going to be like the contract or agency route. And when we're talking about structures, that um, small businesses, again, definition is gonna be loosely, loosely used here in terms of setting up an internal team. 
Honestly, if you find the right people, it can be a two person hit squad. So you can have someone who you're classifying as media buyer, but also wears creative strategy hat, who also is briefing out and a really, really strong designer who's starting to pick up on numbers and pump out what you need. Those two together, especially if you don't have a lot of red tape on making decisions can make it a lot easier for you. I hope that helps. Cool. Um, and the next question is from Chris. How do you do static testing? Great question, Chris. So static testing, you are missing out a lot on like the thumb stop and like you're missing out a lot on the um, like building of audiences based off of video viewers. So it's a good thing to test. But when we're talking about like statics themselves, do you all remember how I had chatted about comparing click-through rates to conversion rates as the main focus of things? So click-through rates, let us know who's clicking. Conversion rates, let us know who's buying. So what I would do is a very similar analysis to creative versus landing page. If I see low click-through rate, but high conversion rate, it lets me know that my creative isn't as good. So if that's the case, it's like, let me try a text overlay. Let me try lighting. Let me try the mashup a different way. Whereas if we see a high click-through rate means people are clicking and going to your website, but low conversion rate, your creative's fine. Just ultimately look at the website. Um, that's how I'd say like focus on iteration rooted in data. And then in terms of new concepts and variation, like I was saying earlier, once you know the problem and the concept you're going after, just try some different things, get it live into the account, see where Facebook's spending your money, all that kind of stuff. Is that helpful? Sorry. <laughs> so moving on to, I think is the last question, how to best document creative findings, how to transfer them to creative teams. Um, the reason that I pause is because like, they're almost two separate questions in my mind. Like part of it is like, how do I move this to a creative team? It could be a new ask I have. It could be education focused, that kind of stuff. Whereas the documentation I think of as memorialization. So it's like, where is a log of things that we've tested and what went down there? So when we're talking about the best way to be able to, to transfer findings to a creative team, um, again, I'll plug motion. We make it really easy to visualize, analyze, and share. So making that process is where we focus. But if uh, motion isn't what you're using, I'd say a lot of screenshots and decks. So like screenshots, the exact ads that you're talking about, insert some of the data points, not all of them, simplify it, insert some of the data points so they can see why it's relevant together and share that information. And then in terms of the tracking, so meaning, hey, we ran X amount of tests, what the heck went down type of deal. I'm a big fan of like spreadsheets for now. So there's some templates that I have in the deck, like I was mentioning from Connor and Rahul. Um, that stuff that you can actually check out. Great. And we just got one last question uh, come through. Is the slide deck for this going to be emailed or is there a link? Great question. Uh, maybe we both speak to it, but it's emailed uh, in our world. So we'll include the recording and we'll include the deck just in that email. So you can access it, go through, download, do what you got to do. Great. I think, I think that concludes questions. Um, thank you so much you everyone for, for all these great questions and the level of engagement. It was a pleasure having you here. Um, so Evan, do you want to pause the recording and, and any final words? Um, nothing final on my end. Every, everybody, it's just like, no matter what stage you're at, like creative strategy is definitely going to be an important part of like your future, especially when we're talking success, when it comes to paid advertising and acquiring new audiences. So just like, I don't want to say take it seriously tomorrow, but at the same time, hopefully this presentation gave you a little bit of insight on where to start and hopefully make it a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, if there are any other questions, feel free to connect with me, feel free to connect with our team. Um, but looking forward to, to keeping this conversation going, everybody. Thank problem, you so Kev. No problem, Gabby. Thanks, Roy.